Teresa Malik Searle, nurse practitioner in the Division of Pain Medicine at Stanford Healthcare in Redwood City, California. I do acute and chronic pain management, and I've been working in the field for about 20 plus years. Now I have some questions related to uh, the talk on Tourette syndrome. We noticed that cannabinoids seem to be an emerging treatment option for this. We were wondering if you could elaborate maybe on a high level about this a bit more. Um, you know, kind of what's their proposed mechanism of action if it's known? Um, <clears throat> how effective does it seem to be at a high level compared to maybe what else is out there? Uh, and you know, what's, what's needed to advance this as a treatment option further? The expanding interest in the use of cannabinoids in Tourette's syndrome, um, I don't think, again, at a high level we know exactly what the mechanism is. And I think it's the same when you look at cannabinoid medicines in, in, in most of the neurological conditions right now. We've got um, one product that's FDA approved for epilepsy, pedi uh, refractory pediatric epilepsy on the market, Epidiolex. Um, and it's CBD, purified CBD from the cannabis sativa plant. And the thought is that, so we know a lot about the endocannabinoid system and how that uh, modulates neurological diseases as well as a whole host of others. So it, it works, cannabis works in the endocannabinoid system. Is it um, at a, um, a cellular level where it really decreases the binding of um, certain endocannabinoids um, to the CB1 or the CB2 receptor site. I mean, we just don't know. We know that ticks, phonic ticks, motor ticks, are um, a neurological condition. We know that there are um, emotional stressors that trigger that. So um, cannabis can really work to suppress not only the motor activation, but also the whole kind of psychological behavioral aspect to um, the Tourette syndrome you know, presentation. Again, I wish I had more of a high-level, highbrow. If the studies really haven't been done. They're too preliminary to say this is exactly how it works and why it works. The studies are being done. But the reality of it is, is that you have a lot of patients out there that are using cannabis as a self-treatment. So as healthcare providers, we need to be educated at a basic level about what our patients are using and, and what are the known um, conditions that it's used for and how does that relate to uh, Tourette syndrome currently. Regarding emerging research in Tourette syndrome, so we noticed that you highlight data setting genes WWC1, FN1, um, and IPBL. Um, so these have about a 70 to 90% probability of causing Tourette syndrome uh -huh. in talk. So what role do these play in the etiology of disease? Is it known, kind of like how you go from mutation to disease? Yeah, <sighs> again, there is so much that we don't know. and, and most of the research that has been done to date has been in the pediatric population because that's really where we're looking. And how did genes change over time? And how does that really reflect the presentation of the symptoms of Tourette syndrome in the you know over 18 population? I don't think we know yet. I think the, the research in genetics um, doesn't necessarily always cross over to clinical applicability. So you know, we can identify changes in genes um, that could be potentially predictive, but is that gonna change the treatment? We just don't know yet. I don't think that there's enough, you know, we're still at the ground roots in terms of research um, identification. And you know, not a lot of the genetic research has been done in the pediatric population. So we're still at the forefront of that. Um, so I don't have a great answer. Stay tuned next year. Maybe we'll talk more about it. Okay, if there's not, enough known about it right now, maybe we don't know if we can use these as therapeutic targets. Or what's your viewpoint on that? Is it possible? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I don't, I mean, I think that there are, there are the potential for a lot of therapeutic targets. I think you have to really um, identify how much um, of the disease is problematic in, you know, the adult population, right? So we see the symptoms in adolescents and in, in pediatrics, and I think a lot of the treatment has been um, supportive, um, not so much pharmaceutical. Um, you see research of um, functional MRI imaging, identifying target regions in the brain that we know um, if they fire can result in kind of motor symptoms and even phonic symptoms. That's really where a lot of the research is going right now. I think 
we just, I think more money needs to be put into genetic research and um, the trials of what you can do, you know, at that level. I just think it's too early. It's, you know, we, we, we haven't even, see, we've identified um, potential genetic markers. We still have to do the animal studies to identify if it's going to be helpful or not. Um, but yeah, I think that, you know, that, that having that knowledge is going to be paramount in terms of where we can, you know, have the next generation of treatments. Some of these genes seem like they're involved in like early neurodevelopment, synaptic plasticity. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, do you think this may be the basis for research on neurostimulation in Tourette's syndrome? Uh, if you could elaborate maybe a little bit more on some of the invasive and non-invasive approaches that were highlighted in the talk. Sure. So the question is a bit of a complicated one because I don't necessarily think that the um, the genetic receptor targets that you're talking about, I think they're going to really um, lend themselves to more pharmaceutical treatments um, or gene manipulation, again, which, you know, is controversial right now because we don't know enough about, you know, how we can modulate someone's genetic profile for improvement of disease. I think we're far from that. But I think that's where you're going to see identifying those genetic targets are going to be predictive of, you know, disease and support in the future, but I also think it's going to be more relevant for pharmaceutical um, development. In terms of the invasive therapy, so deep brain stimulation is really um, kind of what we're looking at um, in, well, it's active now, right? So there are many patients that actually have had deep brain stimulation um, and for refractory treatment, again, because of the invasiveness and the side effect profile of it and the monitoring, um, it, it winds up being you know, the last step. We see neuromodulation um, in pain medicine more broadly used, right? But when you start putting leads in the brain, what is that gonna mean? Um, and then again, most of this research is, um, most of the identification of Tourette's syndrome patients has been more in the pediatric population. So I think that, um, neurosurgeons are a lot less open to wanting to put stimulators in a child's brain. That's why I think it's important to have disease state education, identification of adults, right? Um, the fact that this is not something that stops at age 18, that actually it progresses into adulthood and then these uh, treatments in the adult population. So where we are with deep brain stimulation right now, and they've had um, a lot of good success with patients, again, the small number of patients internationally that have been implanted, is identifying the best region of the brain to place the stimulator leads. And that's kind of where the, the research is going on right now. Um, so again, depending upon the patient, is genetic identification of targets in the brain, I don't think that's realistic, but I think that's where functional MRI imaging comes in, is really identifying when someone's having their, um, their episodes, when they're having their tics. Um, so creating the, the symptoms and then identifying you know, where, what areas of the brain are lighting up, and that's really where the, uh, the targets have been looked at in terms of placement of leads right now. Just to confirm, is, is TMS also used in Tourette syndrome research? Because I know it's used. That's for... a good. That's a great question. Um, I I don't know of any. Uh, I think it would be a great thing to study. I haven't seen. I don't know of any studies right now that are being done for TMS for Tourette's specific. Um, however, clinicaltrials.gov is a great website for um, clinicians, researchers, even patients to go to, where you can get a list of um, studies that are being done, small studies, large studies, internationally, you know, around the corner from you. Um, so you don't need to work at an academic medical center really to, to find out what's going on. But I think that that would be a, a wonderful, we do a lot of TMS research um, in pain management. And when you think about kind of the interplay, again, of the brain, Tourette's, and the symptoms that we're seeing, that, that seems like a, we see TMS used for depression, right? And so it's the same mechanisms collectively in a lot of ways. So I think that it would be, it's a great area of study. Mm -hmm.